Good afternoon and welcome to the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Hot Topic Session, which is called Climate Crisis, Facts and Action. My name is Michele Catanzaro, I'm a science journalist, I have a PhD in physics and I am the person that has designed this session and will moderate it. Um, so you may have noticed that climate change is increasingly being referred to as climate crisis or climate emergency to signal how urgent the problem is and how late we are doing in tackling it. Um, we have faced complex environmental and health issues in the past, leading gasoline, um, Hodgson hole, Hodgson layer hole, or even nowadays uh, the global tobacco epidemics. However, none of these problems is as complex as climate change in that it is a really multi-dimensional problem uh, dealing with things that are really embedded in the basic workings of our society. So when I was assigned to organize this hot topic session, I thought, how can I make it something really effective, given the urgency of the problem? And I think that the, let's say, underlying question under the very different and important presentation that we will see is basically what can this community, mathematicians and computer scientists, do to help with this issue. So I would be happy if uh, each one of you goes away from the session with what one or idea or two of what they could do. Um, the session will be divided in two parts, facts and actions. So the first part will be about um, the frontiers of basic research in climate change, while the second part will be more in the interface between science and society, dealing with subjects like how to communicate climate change, what are the political, historical, and even psychological boundary conditions to be taken into account. Each session will be basically a series of talks. After each talk, if there's time, there will be time for one or two burning questions, but then at the end, there will be a round table with uh, um, time for questions from the floor, comments, remarks, etc. So, uh, I would immediately start with the first talk, Professor Chris Budd. Uh, please welcome on stage. Uh, Professor Chris Budd is Professor of Applied Mathematics at the University of Bath. Uh, where he is Deputy Director of the Institute for Mathematical Innovation. He is also Gresham Professor of Geometry. He has been working with the UK Met Office on methods, uh, improved methods for weather and climate forecasting, and he also works for energy, food and insurance companies to assess the impact of climate change on them. And moreover, he is, as you can see from his in an passionate uh, a mathematics uh, communicator, and he will talk about the mathematics of climate change. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. And, um, it's a very great honor for me to speak uh, to this wonderful audience. So I want to talk about the role that mathematics plays in helping us to understand climate change both in the past and into the future. So despite rumours to the contrary, our climate is changing, and it's changing very rapidly. The World Meteorological Organization this week said that we have just experienced the five warmest um, years on record, and here is the temperature of the Earth going up significantly over the last 150 years or so. Another manifestation of climate change is that sea level is rising, um, it's also rising pretty fast, and of course this impacts on many people living in coastal regions. Another area we see climate change being very significant is the melting of the ice, and this is the ice melting in the polar regions in the Arctic, um, causing an influx of fresh water into the Atlantic. So the climate is changing in many ways. Um, it's also changed more slowly in the past. One of the common comments about climate change is people say, well, the climate's always changed. Well, it has, but it changed more slowly in the past than it does now. These are, this is uh, thousands of years, and this is the ice ages where we cool down, warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down, and currently warming up. Um, and one of the questions that we ask in climate change from mathematics is, can we understand this and also understand the more rapid changes that we're seeing right now. Okay, so the IPCC, I know we have some members of this here present, relies on models to help understand what the climate is going to do in the future. 
And these models, broadly speaking, are based on mathematical principles. And just to give you a taste, um, here are a series of climate centers. This is the Hadley Center in the middle, which I work with a great deal, making various predictions of the temperature for the whole Earth over the next 100 years or so. And we can see they're all predicting um, a significant rise. And we get slightly different values depending upon the nature of the models. I'm very pleased to say that the UK prediction is bang in the middle of all the others. Nice sort of compromise there. So this is what the models are doing. They're predicting into the future. But one of the key things about models, as you can see, the different centers have different values. And any prediction has to be accompanied with a quantification of the uncertainty. So this is a graph, again, from the Hadley Center, uh, showing the kind of prediction going up here, but also the uncertainty associated with that prediction. And a key part of mathematical modeling of the climate is quantifying that uncertainty. And I'll come back to that a bit in a minute. So this is what is currently informing the IPCC, these mathematical models. And climate modeling is part of a broader system of modeling we call Earth system modeling. So climate modeling is here on the right uh, with the oceans and the atmosphere and the sun and various things like that. Um, that then impacts on things like agriculture and uh, energy production and so on, which is over here. And then that in turn impacts on human settlement and so on over here. So this is an Earth system model. And I would say that this is the most understood bit and over here, the human interaction is the least understood bit. But we should always think of climate modeling very much as part of this broader system of Earth system modeling. Now, here's a picture, again, from the Hadley Center showing the various models that they use for both weather and climate forecasting. And the point about this model, this picture, is to show that there is a variety and a hierarchy of models that they use. So on the left, we have models which are good for predictions over a few days with a very good resolution. This is the grid size here. So this is kind of weather forecasting models over here. And then over here, in this circle, we have the models that are used for climate. So in terms of the climate models that are being used to inform the IPCC, we're talking with them of uh, predictions over about 100 years on length scales of around about 100 kilometers. But these models are, in turn, part of a broader hierarchy of models. So if I look at this, um, here we have the Earth system models, which we looked at over here, which are very complex with a very large number of components. Over here, we have the global climate models, which are being used to inform the IPCC. And over here are intermediate climate models down to energy balance models, which are much simpler, but allow us to make predictions over longer periods of time. So if I was to summarize that in words, um, here's the sort of hierarchy that we see of different types of models. Um, on the top, the uh, global circulation models, which are global models of climate, uh, looking at billions of, um, of variables, millions of lines of code, very, very comprehensive, but because of their complexity, difficult to analyze and understand. Uh, feeding into these are the um, Earth um, models of intermediate complexity. This is kind of where I operate in my own work, which are simpler models which try to encapsulate as much of the climate as we can, um, which we can do analysis on, which can then be used both to um, help validate the global circulation models, and also we can use, do predictions over much longer periods. So GCM, we could probably predict about 100 years into the future with an intermediate model. We have a chance of understanding the ice ages that I talked about earlier. And then the simplest types of models, energy balance models, which I will talk about in some detail later on, which is where, by looking at basic physics of energy, you can actually make quite reasonably uh, good predictions as to where we might be heading into the long term and also understand climate sensitivity. So here's our hierarchy. All of these methods are important, 
and each feeds into and supports the other. And there's active research going on in all of these areas um, and well worth getting into any of this. Okay, so I said modeling the climate is difficult and uncertain. I love this quote from Niels Bohr, uh, also associated with Yogi Berra, which is very hard to predict anything, especially into the future. So why do we get uncertainty in climate modeling? Well, one is um, there's an awful lot of data, some of which is difficult to measure. If you're talking about data in the Antarctic or Arctic, that's particularly hard to get at. So that's one reason for uncertainty. Another reason which I'm particularly interested in, I know other panel members are as well, is the nonlinearity in the system um, can lead to chaotic effects and um, that's one reason you can't predict the weather very far into the future. But fortunately these, these kind of um, don't affect the general trends that we're trying to understand in climate modeling. Um, the system is incredibly complex. As I said, the GCMs are working with billions of variables, billions of variables. There's an awful lot going on. Um, here's an interesting one, uh, which climate skeptics often talk about. What's the relationship between cause and effect when everything is tightly coupled? So if you look back to the ice ages, you'll see that temperature tends to precede, changes in temperature tends to precede changes in CO2. So that's kind of an interesting issue, but it's because of the coupling that CO2 is important. And last but not least is the distinguishing between natural and man-made variation. As I said, one of the climate uh, skeptic uh, concerns is that the climate's been varying loads over the last million years or so. How do we know what's going on nowadays is due to natural variation or human? And I'll address this in a minute. So all of these sort of levels of uncertainty from a modeling point of view, we build them into our models, but they also lead to kind of skepticism in the uh, media. So here's the UK Daily Express, um, not one of the most kind of um, solid papers in a way, but here we are very much uh, disagreeing with uh, some of the conclusions that I have just drawn. Um, and um, I give talks on climate change. I post videos on my uh, website. Um, and these attract comments, and it's very interesting looking at the comments. So here's just a few of them. I won't read them out. You can kind of absorb them. These are some of the more polite comments. I've had other comments about me which I wouldn't want to put up. Um, but here we are. These comes off quite often. Climate has always been changing. All climate change is due to the sun. And the one I like best is maths. Nah, it doesn't actually have anything to do with climate. So these are kind of responses that I'm having to deal with in my own website. OK, well, despite this, um, I would argue that mathematical and statistical modeling is still our best bet to try to understand what is going on. So one thing about mathematics is that we can be objective. To quote my dear party friend David Mackay, it takes the hot air out of climate modeling. Another thing that mathematics can do is it can help us understand the sensitivity of our climate to change. And one aspect of that sensitivity is understanding how a shift in the mean can lead to an increase in extreme events. Um, another is it allows us to understand the true relationship between cause and effect. Uh, and finally, it allows us to make predictions into the future. For example, how does climate affect flooding and so on like that. So how does modeling work? Well, every single climate model I know starts with the laws of physics. You then formulate these as partial differential equations. You inform them with as much data as you can. You build the uncertainty into the model before you start. And then you solve them numerically. So that's the basic process. Um, how does it work in detail? Well, in detail, you get um, measurements of um, air and moisture, velocity in ocean, stuff like that. Um, you couple these with um, estimates for how the sun and gravity and so on um, are affecting those. And then you formulate them as differential equations. And I know, given this audience, that will be OK. Um, so these are the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, which are basically what we use to forecast the weather with. And these are the basis of climate models. Um, with weather forecasting, you have to be honest 
because if your weather is wrong, you know next day you got it wrong. With climate, it's a bit harder to tell. But these are the basis of our um, models. And then this shows the development over the last a few decades at the Hadley Center of all the other things that you build in to make the climate work, climate models work. So this is the basis of these large models. Um, and then, of course, if you have a model, you need to test it. Well, one of the problems with climate is that the evolution is over long periods of time, so it's quite hard to fully test these things. Um, but one thing you um, certainly do is you test by seeing how well they can hindcast. In other words, predict past climate. So this is a nice slide. In gray, we see what the model does if you run it from data about 150 years ago uh, without putting in man-made carbon dioxide change. And you can see the model under predicts the temperature by quite a long way. Um, if you put in man-made carbon dioxide but leave out the effects of El Nino and volcanoes, again, they don't line up particularly well. But if you build in man-made CO2 and natural things, then the predictions of the model and the observations over the last 150 years line up very well. So this not only helps validate the model, but also clearly shows that CO2 is important. Um, here's another prediction. This one was made some years ago, around about 1980, by Hansen um, in science. They hindcast a, a, a model um, based on energy balance. I'll talk about this in a second and then saw how well it predicted. And to be honest, it's done a reasonably good job. Um, and here's a similar hindcast over here, and then prediction from the IPCC. Again, it's done a reasonable job. So models actually do a reasonable job of predicting the future, again, despite what some of the climate skeptics might like to claim for them. So I just want to walk you through uh, a couple of models quickly, just to show you um, how some of the simpler models work and how we can use these to make predictions. So the simplest model, one that's gone, been around for about 150 years uh, due to Arrhenius, is saying basically energy coming from the sun into the earth is then balanced by energy radiated out from the earth. This is called an energy balance model. Um, here's the basis of the model. You have solar radiation, S of T, um, a proportion A, which is about 0.3, of this is reflected, the rest is absorbed, and then when you average it over the Earth's surface, you get 1 minus A, S of T, coming in. Um, this then gets down to the Earth's surface, is radiated away from the Earth's surface, so you get a flux, which is black body radiation here. This heats up the atmosphere, which in turn radiates out into space or back into Earth again. So these are the various energy balances um, associated with a very crude model where we regard the Earth as a single point and the atmosphere as a single point. Um, if you do balances, if you balance flux into the atmosphere against flux coming out of the Earth, you get this balance for the mean atmospheric temperature against the Earth's mean temperature. And if you go off and check, it's basically right. So these models are reasonably predictive. Um, and then when you incorporate things like the transparency of the atmosphere to long-wave radiation and the transparency of the atmosphere to short-wave radiation, you get this wonderful formula here, which comes from this, and that allows you to predict the temperature of the Earth um, as a, measure, a factor of these things here. So that's kind of what you can do with an energy balance model. Um, do they work? Well, basically they do, and they're reasonably predictive. Um, so the power of this model is that you can make predictions, you can see roughly what the influence of CO2 is. Um, CO2 uh, decreases the transparency of the atmosphere to long-wave radiation, which in turn uh, decreases um, this number E, uh, which in turn increases the temperature of the Earth. And um, so that's carbon dioxide going up. That allows us to measure sensitivity. And you can even improve this model to allow for... Um, the effect that the Earth's albedo changes, and, and that allows us to find even bigger sensitivity. So very simple models like this allow us to check the sensitivity of the temperature, and then these can then be used to help validate 
and um, build into the uh, global climate models that we'll be learning about um, shortly. So I've only got a short period of time, so I won't be able to take you through my models for ice ages, so I shall quickly go through to my conclusion, um, which is that I argue strongly that mathematical models... Oh, do I have time to do the ice ages? Let's do the ice ages then. Um, so we can also develop simple models um, which allow us to go back in time and have a look at paleo data, um, ice age data. Um, so this is kind of fun. We've known for some years that the radiation from the sun changes um, due to the wobbling of the Earth on its orbit. Um, this is radiation from the sun. This is the total solar forcing. Um, and then we can build models um, what, um, inter of intermediate complexity. Um, so here's one of my favorite models. It's the, called the Pallard and Paralim model of ice volume, Antarctic ice, and carbon dioxide, which allow us to see how the temperature of the Earth is synchronized to these variations in the uh, solar forcing. And what I love about these models is, although they're quite simple, you can do a lot of maths on them and actually compare the predictions against past data. Um, and this is a prediction from the model um, made by one of my PhD students, actually, which lines up really quite well with what we observe um, over the ice ages over half a million years. So if I just conclude, um, I maintain that the use of mathematical and statistical models combined with uncertainty is the best way to predict future climate and to understand things like the ice ages. Um, and without these models, we don't really have any grounds for saying anything. Um, and we need a hierarchy of models all feeding into each other to fully explain what's going on. Um, no model is better than the physics on which it's based, so we absolutely need that physics. We absolutely need the data. But just to say at the end, despite what climate skeptics and climate deniers say, these models are reliable. So we are getting predictions out of them which are squaring up with what we see. And I think that gives us an objective way of understanding what will happen in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chris, for uh, giving this uh, great introduction to the subject of the hot topic. By the way, if mm, somebody of you doesn't know it, IPCC means Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. It's a group of scientists that established the uh, consensual evidence on climate change. So there's time for a couple of burning questions before the following talk. One there. There should be a microphone, I guess. Ah, okay, over there, yeah. Ah, oh, fantastic. So thank you for that very nice talk. You are using physics-based models, yes. differential equations, basically, yes. um, which, of course, uh, most of it has positive Lyapunov exponents, which, yes, exactly. which is what makes it such a hard problem. Yes. There are new approaches that involve uh, uh, machine learning and AI, yep. which are very different from this, and I'm wondering if you've been interacting with the people who are doing this. I know of one researcher who used the input yeah. of some of these models as some of the data in a machine learning model. But I'm wondering, just in, in general, uh, how much you are interacting with this new way or well, different way the, the of answer, doing... Yeah, by the way, climate. great question. The answer is very, very heavily. In fact, a large part of my research is looking at how well you can predict weather using machine learning. I haven't tried climate yet um, because we've got so much more data and it's much easier to verify things. And I should say that the Met Office does use machine learning uh, not for what it calls its dynamic equations, but for the parameterized. It's where, where you look at physics below the grid scale um, and how that feeds in. So um, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Okay, and in fact, the next talk, thanks, Chris, will be will touch upon the subject, I guess. So um, I would like to invite uh, Sonia Seneviratne. She's full professor at uh, for land climate dynamics at ETH Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute for Technology in Zurich, um, and she's currently coordinating lead author 
of the IPCC sixth assessment report, which is expected to be released in uh, 2021. Uh, her research uh, mm, is related to climate extremes, land climate interaction and terrestrial water processes and she will talk about how to speed up climate research. Thanks, Sonia. Th uh, thanks very much for the introduction. It's also a great honor for me to give this presentation in front of uh, this distinguished audience. So I will speak about how to speed up climate research and actually it will beat up directly on the question that was just asked in the uh, preceding uh, talk. Um, so, but I just want to start also with the state of the climate to say what is the problem we are dealing with. Uh, this uh, seminar, the hot topic seminar, is because it is a hot topic and it's really an urgent issue. This is just to illustrate what we are experiencing at the moment because of climate change. So the latest IPCC report on the global warming of 1.5 has shown that in 2017 we had already one degree of global warming. Uh, just a few days ago, a new synthesis report was released showing that we have reached 1.1 degree of global warming, so we are getting very close to 1.5. Now, we are saying what has happened recently with uh, this type of global warming. So, for instance, last year in 2018, we had a range of uh, hot extremes uh, across the northern hemisphere and also some uh, droughts and fires, for instance, in Sweden. Uh, there were fires in Japan and Canada, there were heat waves, many people died as a consequence of this. There were fires in California following very hot and dry weather. And actually a recent study uh, from our group has shown that the occurrence of all these events at the same time could not be explained without the occurrence of climate change, only for a very small fraction. Uh, this year also we had very extreme conditions. So for instance in France, uh, this summer for the first time, 46 degrees was reached. And actually, uh, we had a conference on statistical climatology in Toulouse, and I was traveling by train back from the conference just on that day around this area. It was really hot. Uh, and then uh, just, of course, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a tropical cyclone Dorian in the Bahamas. So the frequency of tropical cyclone is not directly affected by climate change, but warmer air can hold more moisture, which means that the tropical cyclones are associated with more precipitation. And also uh, some new studies are showing that they tend to move uh, more slowly, which means that it's still longer at the same location. And this is what happened and also led to a lot of uh, damages. So we see that there are already strong impacts of climate change, even just uh, recently. And as mentioned, there's been this uh, very recent uh, synthesis of a range of reports from the United Nations that was released actually just a few days ago, which provides a summary of where we are at. And really the message here is that it's uh, very... Uh, issue, uh, we have uh, large issues, so basically we have uh, had the warmest five-year period uh, from 2015 to 2019. As mentioned, we have already 1.1 degree of global warming. Uh, the climate impacts uh, now seem to be hitting harder than what we were expecting. Uh, and the main issue, of course, is that the action in terms of reducing emissions is not really taking place. So we continue to have an annual growth in CO2 emissions and actually we have the re record emissions in 2018. Uh, so at the moment it's not clear whether the emissions could peak anytime soon, so if we could basically uh, reach a threshold we can start to reduce emissions. Um, and so if we want to reach uh, or basically limit global warming to, to two degrees, we would have to need to have a triple, tripling of the policies or, or we would need to have a fivefold increase in policies to limit global warming to 1.5. So just to show what is the warming that we have had so far, you see here in black the change in global mean temperature. And as mentioned, we have reached more than one degree of global warming already. And if you look at the temperature on land, actually the temperature on land is increasing more uh, quickly than the temperature on the global mean because the ocean is warming uh, less quickly, which means that temperature that matters to us has already reached more than 1.5 degree uh, on average. Uh, now, this is a graphic from the IPCC special report on 1.5, which shows where we are now. And you see, again, here is the evolution of the observed global mean temperature. And in 2017, it could be estimated that the anthropogenic contribution, so the human-induced global warming, was uh, about one degree. And you see that much of the observed warming can be attributed to human influence. Now, if you look forward, obviously, if you want to stabilize warming to 1.5, this means really a radical change in how we are dealing with uh, our emissions of CO2. 
And uh, obviously, this needs to happen very quickly because if we don't do anything, then we would reach 1.5 degree of global warming in the, between 2030 and 2050. Now, what tells you that there is a link between uh, CO2 and global warming? Uh, there is a lot of science on this. Uh, Chris Bell has presented this. Uh, I think this graphic is really useful. It's from the IPCC report, from the fifth assessment report in 2013, and it shows a direct link between the cumulative uh, CO2 emissions, so the total CO2 emissions we have had since pre time, and the global wind warming. And we see here the observations, so we are, as mentioned, at around one degree of global warming. If we want to limit global warming to 1.5, obviously the remaining budget that we have is very small, because we have used more than two-thirds of this budget already. Now, what do we need to do from now on if we want to limit global warming to 1.5? I should say it's a really uh, a challenging task. And also the report, the 1.5 report from IPCC says it requires unprecedented change in society. Of course, the fact that they are unprecedented doesn't mean that it's not possible to do it. It just means that we have to change our way of doing things. So uh, that's uh, emissions we have at the moment, about 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. And so we would need to follow this uh, blue trajectory if we want to limit global warming to 1.5. And this includes uh, immediate reduction of CO2. Until 2030, about a halving of C uh, CO2 emissions compared to 2010 on global scale. So obviously some countries might need to do this more quickly. And we would need to reach net zero CO2 emissions at the latest in 2050, but that only gives us a partial change of achieving 1.5. If we want to have a higher chance of achieving it, we need to reach net zero in 2040. Now, a big issue is the fact that this blue line here is going negative after reaching net zero. So those scenarios also imply that we take up CO2 from the air after we are reaching net zero, and there are a range of methods that are considered in the literature but we should say this is a really uh, difficult part. On the one hand, you could do some reforestation or afforestation, but this is not a panacea. You can, of course, not plant really everywhere. You have some locations uh, where you need to plant crops. In addition, some location trees would lead to a warming. Uh, in addition, there are some other technologies that are being developed currently to uh, suck up CO2 from the air but the technology to store it is not well established yet. So this is a big issue, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so we are speaking really of a massive change in how we are dealing with the climate system and basically following a very different strategy from what we had so far. It also means a change in climate science because so far what we had was projecting change that would happen if we were to do nothing, so basically until the end of the 21st uh, century. Now, if we want to inform decision-making and we manage to start going on this slope, this means that we'll have to have near real-time information on climate projections. So we don't want to know what is going to happen about 30 years from now. We also need information on this. But on the, on the other hand, we need this kind of near real-time information for uh, decision-making. So we need to predict when you are around here, what is the chance that we would, for instance, miss a target and assess a range of possible policies. It also means that we need a, a better uh, coordination and interaction between the climate physicists, impact scientists, and mitigation experts. So Chris Bird just saw before, we have this range of uh, models that we are using. On the one hand, the climate physics, but we have also some models presenting uh, mitigation option impacts. And we need a better interaction between those different elements if we want to inform decision-making correctly. Uh, and I think that's the main point I want to make here, is the previous way of interaction uh, it's actually too slow to inform society now, given the challenge we are facing. Because we had a kind of six-year cycle from the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Just different communities were working more or less separately, but the exchange was not happening very quickly. Now we are speaking of fundamentally changing our uh, human system very quickly, and we need to inform this much, much more quickly. So I uh, just mentioned the IPCC reports. Uh, these are just some examples from those reports. As mentioned, some of them are dealing with physical sciences. At the same time, there were also always reports, for instance, on impact and adaptation or mitigation. And so the exchange was happening between those uh, reports, to some extent, also between those communities, but there was not a lot of integration. One exception is the recent report uh, on the global warming of 1.5, which actually included scientists of all three uh, 
branches and actually Pauline and I, uh, Pauline Dube is going to speak later on, was also involved in this report. And I think there for the first time we find out how powerful it is to have more interaction between scientists from these diverse areas. So now I come to, to this challenge. As mentioned, we have three different parts of the Earth system we are simulating. The first part is basically the starting point for any climate projections are uh, scenarios. So we basically have scenarios of how society is developing. And this includes uh, changes in population and also mitigation, so possibly mitigation approach, uh, but of course also aspects related to how the society is to develop and what it needs. So for instance, agriculture, change in economy and change in mitigation. So for instance, what are the trajectories of fossil fuel emissions? Uh, do you use more renewable energy, more bioenergy, carbon ca and do you have carbon capture and storage? Also, scenarios that are basically uh, developed by what is called integrated assessment models. So people who are developing those models are either a geographer or economist. So those scenarios are being developed and then they are used as input to climate models. So that's the climate models we have just seen before. These are mathematical models of the climate system. Those models uh, provide climate projections of the changes in Earth system quantities, change in temperature, precipitation, uh, weather patterns, ocean currents, vegetation, carbon cycle, drought. So this is a separate entity. Then once we have those climate projections from this, we can assess changes in impacts. And so this uh, input here will be used to compute what are impacts, for instance, on agriculture, uh, on ecosystem, economy, health, or water resources. Then there is this type of feedback. Once we have this output, we can assess to which extent those scenarios are more or less realistic. But as mentioned, this only happens in this six-year cycle. Uh, we, there is a bit of a feedback loop here with climate, but it only includes a representation of global mean climate. It doesn't include any regional features or extremes. Now, why would this be important? Uh, if we've, uh, I'm doing a lot of work on extremes, and I would say this is one of the main issues we are facing in terms of uh, possible feedbacks to those scenarios. If you look at change in extremes, uh, basically they affect obviously ecosystem in a lot of those scenarios. So let's say you assume you are going to plant a lot of trees in many locations. The problem is under a change in climate, possibly in some of those locations, those trees are going to be affected by fire or drought. And those models that are used to develop the scenarios don't take this feedback into account. So they don't consider the detail of the change in climate. So uh, such a fire or drought could annihilate several years of CO2 storage in just one year. Obviously, it also affects the production of biofuels or food. And again, the, those scenarios are only developed based on global mean temperatures. They don't consider the regional detail of climate. It also affects biodiversity, animals, and plants. Uh, of course, extremes also affect people, so you could have, you know, when we have projections of change in population, if you have some locations that become less in, uh, habitable, this could basically affect how many people you have there, or if you have possibly some uh, migration or instability in conflicts. This is also not taken into account. Uh, finally, extremes obviously can affect the energy production and use. Uh, just one example among others is that when you have a heat wave, uh, this affects the cooling of nuclear plants. This is a major issue. So let's say you have a heat wave, and actually you need more energy because you want to cool down uh, through air conditioning, but actually exactly in those uh, time frames, you have uh, less possibility of using this electricity. That's a major issue, and it's also not included. Uh, just to illustrate the change in extreme versus change in global mean, uh, this is from a study from our group. It's just to show that uh, for instance, at two degrees of global warming, depending on models on regional scale, you can have a lot of range in response, for instance, up to six degrees uh, here in Central Europe. Now, these are the scenarios that are, used, uh, that are produced by these integrated assessment models in terms of change in land use. Here you have the change in uh, cropland. Uh, blue is increase, the red is decrease. Here you have the change in forest, also increase and decrease. And just to take a few examples, you take this one, these are four very, very, very well established integrated assessment models. This model for the future, for 1.5 degree of global warming, is a scenario where they plant a lot of trees in Russia. Now again, as I was saying, is this realistic if you possibly have uh, fires happening in addition to these trees in that location would rather lead to net cooling, not, to net warming, not a net cooling, like uh, in, the, in the rainforest. 
Uh, on the other hand, for instance, if you look at the ex expansion of cropland, also here in the GCAM model, you see a, a large expansion of cropland in North America. And again, this is a region that has been affected by droughts uh, and will be also more affected by droughts in the future. So how can we accelerate progress? Um, basically, uh, the main issue, as I mentioned, was this lack of interaction between the integrated assessment models that are producing scenarios and the climate models. And I think one way to do, uh, deal with this would be basically to use some uh, machine learning based emulators of the Earth system models. So the way that we could accelerate progress is, would be to use possibly an emulator for climate models. So your input to the emulator is actually the climate model output and you try to emulate uh, how the model is performing. The basic idea is that you have the integrated assessment model that is producing the scenarios, the uh, pro projected changes in the uh, Earth conditions, was well, uh, human conditions, and here you have this Earth system model emulator. And basically by having here an emulator that is very quick, obviously you can speed up the interaction between the two systems. Uh, here I just show that uh, it's not just an idea for the future. This is work from Lea Bosch, a PhD student in my group. Uh, and she has developed a simple emulator just for temperature. Uh, and uh, so one of those uh, Simulation here is a climate model, and the CR3 has this output from a, uh, as an emulator. So you need to represent, obviously, also some inter internal climate variability. And maybe the question, I'm not going to answer this question, is which one is the original model? As you can see, the, the features look quite realistic. So it's just to say, obviously, in front of this audience, that we definitely need uh, scientists from uh, the machine learning uh, field, for instance, also uh, helping uh, research on climate science. I think this is one area where it could be very useful. So I come to the conclusions and outlook. Uh, first, climate research at the interface between physics, biochemistry and biophysics on the one hand, but also human science, so we need to predict how the human society is evolving, or at least look at different plausible scenarios for this evolution, and also impact science, so looking at impacts of climate change on different systems that are affecting us and ecosystems like impact on agriculture, ecosystem uh, science or health. Uh, so these systems are evaluated by different communities and to some extent this is really an issue because this means that the interactions between those communities is quite slow and the output, there is obviously interaction and then the science is evolving but it's evolving slowly and there is not enough of feedback or at least not quickly enough. So uh, the development of geographically explicit climate model emulators could really help feed, uh, speed up research in our, in our field and the interaction between this field. And I think the main motivation for that uh, is that we're dealing in time as we are working against the clock. I think that's the main issue in our field. That's why also there would be a, a big motivation for speeding up research. And I want to finish with those quotes from IPCC uh, regarding the current climate challenge that every action matters Every bit of warming matters and every year matters. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sonia. Uh, I am especially thankful for this message to this community of, about how much uh, machine learning is important for um, coupling these, um, let's say, modeling and impacts uh, models and, uh, and these integrated assessment models and also for the call for urgency, that, that blue graph has a peak in 2020. So we are expected to start reducing emissions in one year from now, basically. Okay. So time for one uh, burning question, please. Hi, thanks for your presentations. Um, I do believe that we are running against the clock, but uh, there's something I don't understand quite well. So. One of the things that also the previous presentation was kind of defending is about the reliability of these models. And if, for example, weather forecast, which also tries to predict uh, temperatures, is, I think, quite unreliable in a lot of situations. So if these models that have been developed for so long are not exactly reliable, how can we look to those predictions and are they reliable? So this is my, my question. Thank Thanks you. a lot. So your, your question is about how, should, why you should, should you trust a climate model when weather forecasting is so difficult? That's your question? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. it's because it's a very uh, different uh, problem. 
So weather uh, forecasting is an initial condition problem, and we have a stochastic system. So basically, the weather is evolving stochastically after about one or two weeks, but within some bounds, in those bounds is basically the climate conditions. And so what we are predicting is not the exact weather in, on the 20th of July 2025 or 2074. We are predicting the average statistical properties of this weather in that time frame. And the models are doing a very good job at doing this. Okay, thanks. So uh, I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, Tim Palmer. Um, yes? He's a Royal Society Research Professor in Climate Physics at the University of Oxford. He was lead author on several IPCC climate change assessment reports. Uh, he has a PhD in general relativity, and his belief in the overarching importance of nonlinearity in physics has brought him to develop several key contribution, essential contribution to the development of probabilistic weather and climate models. And he will talk about the role of supercomputation in climate change research, among many other subjects. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the title I was asked to speak to is about supercomputing. I do want to actually talk about some of the issues about how we might improve our climate models uh, going forward. Um, but sort of building on what's already been said, but maybe being a bit more explicit, climate models, the sort of comprehensive climate models that uh, Chris Budd talked about at the end of the hierarchy of models are actually used nowadays for a variety of societally important processes. Clearly they provide some of the basic um, input into decisions on decarbonization, input into the Paris Agreement and so on. But increasingly people are looking to these models to provide guidance on what types of infrastructure we need to invest in uh, to adapt to climate change. In other words, to make, re uh, to make society more resilient to uh, the increasing extremes of, uh, of climate that we're starting to experience. And then there's this difficult issue which I was raised from time to time about whether there's a plan B. Could we do something to uh, offset the effects of increasing carbon dioxide, for example, by spraying aerosols into the stratosphere to uh, reflect sunlight back to space. Um, of course, the big problem with this is whether there are unforeseen consequences. For example, what would happen to regional circulations like the monsoons or the moisture flow into the uh, rainforests of the world? If you start to disrupt these circulation patterns, you may actually end up doing more harm than good. The only way to investigate such a question is through uh, reliable climate models. And then there's the whole area of trying to make shorter term climate predictions, whether it's the El Nino event that's uh, occurring, starting to occur in the next six months or a year, or maybe decadal timescale fluctuations, for example, in the Atlantic Ocean, which are known to affect uh, drought, the probability of droughts in Africa. Uh, this kind of comes under the near term types of projections that Sonia was talking about very important area of growth. And then, of course, the whole area of understanding. Um, we can't really claim to understand what goes on well unless we have a credible, accurate simulation. Uh, once we have a credible, accurate simulation, we can start to remove processes from the model and see whether they were important or not. And that is what builds understanding. And of course, you know, this is a trivial statement in a way, but if you want to communicate uh, effectively with either public or with government, uh, it's good that you hopefully understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Doesn't always happen, by the way. Um, so it's often said there is a consensus amongst the scientific community about climate change. And I want to just state, in a sense, what precisely this consensus is about. Because, and it relates to the question that was asked at the end of the last talk. Um, there are major uncertainties, which I'll come on to in a second, uh, in, cl in projecting climate change. And so, in a sense, the primary scientific output is not a specific prediction. It will be two degrees, four degrees, whatever it is, warmer. It's a probability distribution. And I'll explain in a second the primary reason why we have these probability distributions. But this is an, an assessment uh, which I would say would be broadly agreed with about what the probability distribution of warming is, global warming, uh, 
for a doubling of carbon dioxide. So what temperature does the Earth equilibrate at if you were to double carbon dioxide? Uh, so it's a probability distribution, and the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is in temperature, global temperature, with from one degree through to uh, six degrees or so. So the most likely value, according to climate models, is around two, two and a half or so degrees. But you see there's a long tail going out to values of you know, five, six or more degrees. We could broadly say that anything to the right-hand side of the mode of that distribution is certainly dangerous level of climate change. And anything that's you know, greater than, uh, say, four degrees or so is catastrophic. It's going to mean there are regions of the world where temperature and humidity is so great that it poses an existential threat to humans because they can no longer heat, lose heat by sweating or anything else. Um, so this makes actually an important conceptual point that when people say climate change is a hoax, for example, or is going to be lukewarm, which is a common uh, kind of climate skeptic position, but equally I would say is going to be catastrophic, then this is actually not a scientifically justifiable statement. Um, we take uh, uh, action because of a perceived and quantified risk of de under, either undesirable or catastrophic processes happening. So we have this uncertainty on global scales. We also have uncertainty uh, even more, and I think we had one or two slides showing that from, from Sonia, on regional time, oh, sorry, on regional scales and for other variables such as precipitation and indeed extremes. Now these uncertainties uh, arise for a variety of reasons, and Chris uh, has given us a talk on that. But I think the most important thing I want to state here is that the, the problem with climate change is it's not just a problem with increasing carbon dioxide. It's a problem with the implications of increasing carbon dioxide on other natural uh, gases and, and molecules in the atmosphere, which also affect climate. And perhaps the most important of this is the water. Uh, w water, and water in all its three phases, gas, gaseous, liquid, and, uh, and ice. But if I had to, and I only have a minute or so to say this, if I had to say one thing that's fundamentally uncertain, it's clouds. It's the role of liquid, or maybe ice crystal droplets in the water. We don't really know whether clouds will amplify climate change or damp climate change. So if low-level cloud cover was to increase, that would actually act as a, as a sort of negative feedback on climate change. It would ameliorate it. Most models suggest it's increasing, it, sorry, most models suggest it's amplifying climate change, but we don't have, a, we don't have any really um, confident certainty about the, the role of clouds. Um, so why is that? And I want to sort of come back to, again, what, something that Chris said. We're basically trying to solve the basic uh, partial differential equations of, of classical physics, which we know well, the Newton's laws of motion, which are the Navier-Stokes equations. But we can't solve those mathematically, so we have to project them onto a finite uh, system and solve it numerically. So we have a, 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 either a, grid, a set of grid points or finite elements, or in the case of the models I tend to work with, spherical harmonics, which project those equations onto a finite grid, and we can represent uh, scales down to, as Chris says, around 100 kilometers or so explicitly with those uh, numerical solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. But there's a whole ton of stuff which we're not resolving. Um, all of the cloud systems in the, around the world uh, flow over small-scale mountains, turbulence in the boundary layers, the fluxes of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere, the, the radiative fluxes uh, in terms of infrared heat out to space, the reflection of sunlight by, by clouds. In the oceans, we can't resolve the uh, little, what are called, um, mesoscale eddies, which help to uh, shape the strength of the Gulf Stream and the Curitio current. And so we, we represent those processes by simplified formulae, parametrizations. They're rather crude representations of physics compared to the very beautiful uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And by virtue of making uh, that d d distinction between the parametrized and the resolved processes, we actually do some violence to the 
symmetry properties of those underlying Navier-Stokes equations, which I'll come to in a second. So it's the fact that we have to truncate the equations that gives rise to this uncertainty. It gives rise to these distributions and why we have to speak about climate change in a probabilistic way. But the question I want to ask is how can we improve things? How can we move to better prediction systems? How can we make our climate models more accurate? So this is some things which I spoke about in a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society a few years ago. So if you want to get more details, you can get it from that paper. So I want to talk about four things uh, in, I'm going to say, increasing orders of, of difficulty. I'm not sure whether, the, anyway, certainly I'm going to start with the easiest, I think, which I hope would resonate with the mathematical audience. It sort of bemuses certainly general public, and I would say it bemuses a lot of my physics colleagues, which is that actually adding noise to the system can actually make it more accurate. Um, and this is a review paper I wrote only a month or two ago in uh, Nature Physics Reviews on uh, moving towards more stochastic weather and climate models. Now, the reason for doing this is threefold. One is that, in fact, a stochastic model does respect this scaling, scaling symmetry of the Navier, the turbulence, uh, if you like, scaling symmetries of Navier-Stokes better than the deterministic uh, formulations. And that helps reduce some of the biases in climate models. Secondly, it gives you an inbuilt way of representing model uncertainty because you, if you rerun your model multiple times, your sampling is stochastic distributions uh, multiple ways and that generates a, an estimate of model uncertainty. But since I'm talking about uh, supercomputing, I want to just focus for a second on the third aspect of stochasticity, which is that currently when we run models on supercomputers, the supercomputers are bit reproducible. Um, they're completely deterministic machines. Now, we pay an energy overhead for bit reproducible determinism, and that energy actually constrains uh, how much computing can be done. Energy is now the primary constraint in determining the power of supercomputers. Um, by the way, this is just a schematic showing how if you make uh, your model's more stochastic, you blur that hard boundary between the resolved dynamics and the parameterization, and that, as I say, is the kind of effectively making the scaling invariance a little respect a little bit better in your numerical solutions. So, um, on that third point about supercomputing, this is, a, a, on the left, a commentary I wrote in Nature a few years ago, a, a sort of extolling the idea that for supercomputing, uh, for many applications, climate being perhaps a primary one, we don't need bit reproducible determinism. Um, and uh, if we can save energy, which could be reinvested in better ways, that may be a, a more fruitful approach. And I was very pleased to see, just literally in the current issue of Nature, there's a, 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 a team who've developed some actual stochastic uh, hardware and um, claiming that they can factorize uh, integers much, uh, uh, much more energetically efficiently than in a conventional uh, uh, computation. So this is actual stochastic uh, hardware in practice. Uh, they call these p-bits, uh, I think this is from an old paper by Richard Feynman on probabilistic computing. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to sort of contemplate that maybe this route towards more probabilistic computing might actually deliver more in the long run than the much uh, vaunted uh, quantum or qubit uh, computing, but that remains to be seen. Okay, so we had a, a, a question about AI, and uh, I've personally actually I organized a workshop in Oxford uh, two, three weeks ago or so on AI for climate uh, modeling. And there are a number of areas where AI can play a role, and the sort of thing that uh, Sonia mentioned, which is sort of downscaling um, using AI to downscale the core scales of, of uh, climate models is certainly one application. But here we were talking about the use of AI actually embedded in the model. And there are three different aspects of AI which uh, we talked about, which I've kind of called soft to hard AI. Um, and on the soft side, the idea is that you train neural nets based on the on the parameterization output. So you're just replacing uh, the parameterizations with uh, neural nets. Now the reason for doing that would be that to actually make the parameterization much more computationally efficient. I, I forgot to say actually that the parameterizations typically take at least half of the total compute time, 
because there are so many subgrid processes that need to be represented. And then some of the really uh, comprehensive Earth system models with full chemical cycles, carbon and so on, okay, um, uh, they take more than 50%. So that's a, that's a process where um, I think there's a lot of potential. Um, there's also the idea, which I call medium AI, of actually trying to learn new types of parameterizations from data and, and put those into the models. And here I'm personally agnostic, and the problem is that we want our models to work in future scenarios where CO2 you know, has risen. Um, and if we're just literally learning formulae from data without any understanding, I think there's a danger that those formulae may not work in a future climate. In other words, extrapolating out of your sample when you don't have physical understanding could be a very dangerous thing. Um, the third thing which people have talked about is completely replacing Navier-Stokes solvers with, with neural nets or AI methods more generally. I am very deeply skeptical about that, and I, I personally don't think it'll work. My three minutes is already up, so I can't say why I believe that, but you can ask me afterwards yes. if you like. Okay, so I just want to, in the last minute, talk about kind of ramping up ambition. Um, climate is an incredibly uh, important problem. We know people are marching around the world rightly uh, about it. But we need to move from this rather blurry picture of what will happen to a much sharper picture. And the only way to do that is to apply these known laws of physics more accurately and more precisely. The problem is we are limited by computer uh, power. Individual institutes do not have access to top-range computers, or if they do have access, they're sharing them with many other users from many other fields. In my view, there is an, this is such an important problem now. We need to treat this with the same level of ambition that the countries of Europe uh, put into uh, nuclear research decades ago, which built the Large Hadron Collider, which did something that no country could do. We need that level of ambition now for climate modeling, and my own proposal is we, with many colleagues, I should say, is that we need something similar to a CERN in, in Europe or you know, in, other, in other continents as well to do at an international level what we cannot do at the national level for lack of resources. And uh, there was a, a, a leader in the New York Times uh, written by uh, Sabina Hossenfelder who basically made this point very eloquently. If we want to know whether climate is going to be catastrophic, or something that's just inconvenient. In other words, if we really do want to know about the sign of the, cli of the cloud feedbacks, uh, we, we need only supercomputers can do the maths. Um, and we have a project called Extreme Earth, which is trying to promote this concept. So just in one minute, I just want to go to the last point, which is sort of moving away a little bit from um, computing and hardware and everything, because nothing is possible, obviously, without the human... Uh, ingenuity and the human resource. And here I am increasingly concerned that in our society we become hard, our careers become hardwired at a very early stage in our careers. You know, you know once we've done a PhD in a subject we seem to be typecast uh, forevermore by that PhD. Now as uh, Michaela said, in my own case I, I move fields, but I'm conscious of the fact that I think today, uh, if I had applied for the job which I got in the climate field, I would not even be shortlisted because I would be seen to not have the right uh, technical or you know, physical knowledge. And uh, you know, my view is that probably many young people here today are doing uh, research degrees because it's been a childhood passion to work on, you know, it could be number theory or some something in topology or something in string theory or something in cosmology. But having done their PhD or maybe some years of postdoc, they want to contribute uh, directly to society and their skills are relevant, for example, in climate. But the way research, the research councils fund training and things, getting people to retrain after some years of PhD and postdoc is very difficult. And I think we're missing out, my own field certainly is missing out on an enormous uh, opportunity to uh, entrain really top quality, uh, imaginative and creative scientists. So, uh, I, with my conclusion, I just say that um, 
The way to think about climate change is in terms of risk. We are clearly increasing the risk towards dangerous or even existential levels of climate change. That's unequivocal, absolutely unequivocal. Um, but for a number of reasons, we do need to develop a much sharper, clearer picture of the future, not just at the global level, but regionally. And my view is this may require, or probably does require actually, a radical rethink, not only in the way we represent climate mathematically through things like stochastics and AI, but actually in the way we fund science and uh, the whole issue of national versus international collaboration. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It was, there were plenty of ideas that I think would be followed by the public here. Probabilistic computers, supercomputation, even looking at clouds to understand what is the role. So there is time for a, one very short a, a question and one very short answer because we are already out of time. Please. Very short. Yep. Thanks. Uh, very interesting points, especially the last point about the human resources. I would like to second what you said, and I would hope that uh, young students, so I'm in maths here in, in Heidelberg, that young students would uh, choose also to learn about PDEs, about numerics, about probability statistics, and not all flock to AI. I think both together can solve the problem, but we need to have them trained in PDEs and in, in more uh, of these fundamental subjects as well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need to reply to that. Okay, okay. fine. <laughs> So we are, as you have seen, we have started with very basic climate, uh, climate model, then we have started to bring in integration of other aspects, and then we go really to the aspects of um, impacts, adaptation, mitigation, sustainability, etc. Uh, so I invite Ofa Polindube to the stage. She is associate professor at the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Botswana and coordinating lead author of the IPCC special report on global warming at 1.5 degrees, and she's uh, also um, deputy chair of the Botswana Government National Climate Change Committee. Uh, her research touches upon a, a, a very broad range of subjects from remote sensing, land degradation, desertification, even gender and environment and other aspects. And she will talk about or, uh, the science of impact, vulnerability, adaptation and mitigation. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I was very proud to be invited by Michelle to come and speak because for one thing, um, in my country when we have about 30,000 kids living in high school, only 2,000 will have taken science, maths, out of that. And fortunately for me, last year, one of those 2,000 was my son. And he has decided to take mathematics, computer science, and physics to prepare himself for university. So you can imagine. So that was really like, okay, something to, to help me push things even at home. But apart from that, yeah, coming to Germany, I don't really do much with the German scientists, but at the same time, for the past five years, I think we have had German uh, supporting Botswana, South, South Africa scientists, uh, Angola, and Namibia on issues of climate change, really giving substantial grants. I mean, it's small, but for one country doing that, it's significant in you know, building a capacity. But having uh, said that introduction, um, I should get, get back to the subject that I've been asked to come and do here. Um, we, we have had a lot of, you know, the modeling, the basic hard science, and now I want to bring you to real life. So I want you to sit straight, you know, to discuss those things that we don't want to discuss, where we usually dig our heads in the sand, as that cartoon is showing, which are the social aspects of climate change. And where, for most of the time, we don't really feel like, you know, as we meds, you know, physics, uh, computer science, do I really belong to that group? But at the same time, also those social science people look at you and say, mm, do they, is there any relevance to us? And I think that gap in between perhaps explains why we, are, why we are here on climate change. We don't make much progress despite all the, what we have heard about the technology in the modeling aspect that is moving on. But we are not moving far in terms of solving the problem. Uh, somebody said perhaps what we'll achieve is to decarbonize poverty, but not really eliminate it. 
Nevertheless, um, I'm supposed to look at a very a wide range of things, which uh, at the end crosses the boundaries to the second group of the presentations. And since uh, right now we have a lot of uh, young people really pushing uh, you know, the issue of awareness on climate change, I thought that is a good place to begin, to say, indeed, it's not only this side of the world. We have had that going on even in our parts of the world. The difference is that while they do that, for example, while they demonstrate against fossil fuel-driven energy, they actually cannot do homeworks because there is not enough light, there is not enough electricity because of issues that go beyond the climate change. So one of my really message underlying this is that climate change, there is something bigger than climate change. For us to solve climate change, we have to recognize this big thing, you know, rather than thinking we can deal with an isol climate change is an isolated issue. Um, there is the young lady who is, you know, everybody is aware of, Greta. I can't set them back, I can't say the, the, the same name. But you know, her message that I don't want you to listen to me, I want you to listen to science, it really also sends that, I mean, for every scientist, it tells you that very soon society will be looking at science and really looking for solutions. And, and some of the presentations we had early are pointing to that factor. But I think in the field of computer sciences, uh, you know, there is also an opportunity at this moment that what can I do to assist the youth? Because I think in her delivery of the message, she needs assistance of really tangible messages where the youth can take action themselves rather than creating awareness. And how do you approach the youth? You have to approach them through the gadgets that they are happy to work on, the computers, the games, you know, the cell phones. And so to me, that is also an opportunity to, 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 for computer scientists to be working on games that can be used to, to change the behavior of these young people as early as possible. For example, why have new clothes when you can have them when you have outgrown them? I can tell you most of the old clothes that are being dumped here, you will find them right in the central part of the Kalahari being sold. You know, all the second-hand clothing are now all over Africa. You will find them coming from the developed world. And, you know, if we just stopped buying, you know, the textile industry itself, you know, the pollution they do, all that reduces things. So our own consumption, our own behaviors have a major role. And I think the young people, as they are going out on the roads, they actually need to be assisted to find ways of changing themselves rather than thinking that somebody is going to deliver the, the solution on climate change. Now, this, this also brings us to the issues that have been discussed by the three, that, you know, the challenge in science, that when now the messages are out there, uh, the way they are taken, they are taken as the absolute truth. And I think it's a challenge to the modeling to make sure that we really come out. Um, it's a continuous challenge because we can never perfectly project climate change. We can only you know, estimate. Now, uh, I'm asked to talk about <laughs> impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. And here, what you get is really what you get in the glossary of the IPCC uh, reports, where the definitions of these terms are given. You know, when you talk about impacts, impacts may be on the physical side, as Sonia has been indicating, on issues of climate extremes, on floods, on droughts. But impacts also affect the livelihoods of people, you know, your health, how are you going to be reacting to heat waves, ecosystems in terms of food production, economy, and so forth. But how the impacts affect you depends on how vulnerable you are, how susceptible you are to those impacts. Are you able to, 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 to cope and adapt to the changes that are happening, you know, and how exposed are you? Exposure could be a question of having your home in the floodplains where you know, when the, the main river is flooding, you are, you are part of the, you know, you are definitely on the way of harm. So ex these issues of vulnerability and exposure are very important because they point to us, the actions we take, determine whether are we going to be affected by climate change and by how much. But maybe I should reflect as well on the issue of vulnerability because vulnerability has so far been accepted to really relate to, you know, a lack of capacity to adapt so that the developing world is seen as the most vulnerable. 
Personally, I think that is not quite useful and is the reason why we are not able to make headway on climate change because vulnerability should be extended to the developed world. You know, those who have invested so much in the carbon economy that we now want to change, I think they are the most vulnerable. And the reason why you don't make action, you find any action from people like uh, Donald Trump, is because he is aware of the level of vulnerability of the economy of the U.S. that is invested in the fossil fuel. And now you are telling us about changing swiftly. So it is not only a matter of somebody being unreasonable. It's because there are real issues to deal with. I give an example of, you know, tropical cyclone in, 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 in Mozambique as an example of, uh, of vulnerability and exposure issue. I don't need to dwell so much on the issues of tropical cyclones and how they are formed because I realize that my colleagues have already gone through. But I can also indicate, since we are also looking at how med science can come into action, that for us to really look at these uh, uh, complex uh, 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 processes of weather, we, we, we need science. We, we, we go all the way to the use of satellite images to be able to interpret the different signals, to develop algorithms, to identify which energy types relate to which areas which have got a, 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 you know, which are warmer than the other. So it's all, you can never uh, remove the, 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 the meds and the science from this, these factors. As you can see, estimating just the temperature of the clouds over a tropical cyclone means you have to engage in the mathematics and the, of, of course linked with the physics part of it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, coming back to tropical cyclones, which is an indication that Sonia has already indicated that, uh, you know, the number of tropical cyclones will probably decline. But the ones that you get, their intensity will be very high. And this is being uh, noted in different regions, Mozambique and Southern Africa. Already that indication was shown. In 2000, they had a more devastating tropical cyclone. They got one not just recently. But the reason also for showing these uh, maps there, because I'm from the geospatial science as well, is an indication that despite for us to actually look at these vulnerabilities, the areas that are affected, you cannot do it without the maths and the sciences in it. So we shouldn't say, because I'm mathematics and computer science, perhaps I don't need to be sitting with the vulnerable uh, guys who are looking at vulnerability and adaptation issues, because you, you, your field is really more needed than ever. So in the case of Mozambique uh, tropical iodine, it was a clear case where exposure and vulnerability met, because for a disaster to occur, you need to be having someone who is vulnerable or an asset and also exposed to that disaster. So the, the tropical cyclone hit on the cities of, uh, where people were not ready for, for, the, for, the, for the disaster at all. And the nature of the disaster was of the, na was of the type where whatever they had prepared themselves to, to react, it was just too fast and they couldn't uh, you know, respond to, to any of that. Now, the other thing that is interesting, as has been noted, is that although tropical cyclones are supposed to be reduced and we worry about their intensity, that reduction is a factor for Southern Africa, as it might be for other regions, that then you, you end up with drought. You have got less rain, as you, have get, you are going to get less tropical cyclones due to global warming. And then you are, you are facing the issues of uh, water shortages. So it's a question of one thing leading to another. And it means, obviously, when you don't have water, people are looking for alternatives. So they are looking at underground water. And very soon, but there is very little that we do in terms of even checking, you know, the level of, of, of extraction of the water and the recharge of, of, at all. Most underground water are actually fossil water. They are not, you know, they belong to the history. Now, all this means that adaptation becomes very important, but adaptation um, yes, I would be trying to say here, there are different types of adaptation. There's planned adaptation, there's um, indirect adaptation where the government is looking at changing institutions in order to prepare people to, you know, to adapt to the climate change. There's ad autonomous adaptation where people adapt on their own. And there's obviously adaptation by natural systems that we, we shouldn't forget. But uh, if you bring back the adaptation for water systems, you realize that there are multiple things that have to be done, different scientists' background has to meet in order to come out with a, a proper direction to adapt just to water. So that slide really is to say there are challenges. Um, 
I used that other slide given what uh, Trump said about African countries. To remember that some of those holes are very important for us. We talk about water holes. <laughs> but uh, adaptation for the developing world, it's much easier maybe to talk more of ecosystem-based adaptation. Why? Because when you preserve ecosystems, they also provide other benefits other than, for example, water, you've got also food systems and the like. And for you to do that, as I show you, the geospatial technologies have to be engaged. And in this slide, we show that there are multiple things, you know, a combination of different science of which the physical sciences yourself, the modeling aspect is very, very important because all this different information has to be brought together and synthesized. And if you are looking at them individually, it becomes very hard. And it, perhaps that is why in the social sciences we are moving slow because we are not having that ability to integrate things. And the computer science is the best way to move in that direction. This diagram also shows you that to look at adaptation, vulnerability, you've got multiple courses that you have to look through and you cross different boundaries. Now these boundaries tell you that adaptation cannot be uh, you know, dealt with individually. It has to be dealt with within the bigger umbrella of sustainable development. And while climate change is seen as one of the goals of sustainable development, actually climate change, as somebody has already indicated in the previous, it cuts across many, um, um, many, it cuts across all the SD, SDGs, if you like. So it's, you, you cannot deal with climate change in isolation. Now this was just an example of ecosystem-based adaptation, uh, as well as linking adaptation with mitigation by managing fires through indigenous uh, knowledge systems, which I won't be able to, to explain in great detail. Another aspect where, why adaptation and mitigation needs to be looked at under the umbrella of sustainable development is so that some of the mitigation suggestions like geoengineering can be looked at more closer because they involve really going to alter the climate system in a way that we don't know what the repercussions could be. Now the real message that I want to say in this is that climate change cannot be addressed in isolation. And for us to really address climate change, I had a feeling that we need to go back to the German Nobel uh, 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 laureate, Paul Krusen, who basically said, having been a long time study in this global change thing, came to a conclusion that we have now changed the Earth system, it's functioning, you know, in a way that we have moved from one geological epoch to another one, which is the Anthropocene. So we cannot go and take climate change is just one of those things that we are feeling under the Anthropocene. And they demonstrated that just the way we are utilizing resources globally, we, we, that we are always picking up. There is no going back, if you like. Whether you're a developing or developing country is similar. We are also on the route to doing that in the develop, developing world. And the impact are also picking in all dimensions. So it's not only a question of climate change. It is the whole environment that is affected. And even the, the thinking, this is a slide from a, a, Will Stefan, one of the uh, uh, scientists who are very interested in advancing the issue of, 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 uh, of uh, the Anthropocene. You know, indicating further that uh, we have lived in the Holocene, there have been variability, but we have moved across the boundary. And the models that have been shown earlier on are also showing that. What is more interesting in addressing the Anthropocene is the social system that leads to the Anthropocene. Because it is the system that we need to change. It is not how much we can model unless we are prepared to look at the social systems that led us to the Anthropocene and saying how do we change the system. And that is where I want to leave you with these slides because that is where we dig our heads in the sand. Because we don't want to address what we are as a society of the Anthropocene, because that is what is holding us. It is not only Donald Trump, it's a society where we are caught up in high level of insecurities as individuals, as systems, as society, as a country, as a whole globe. We live in a, a world of continuous insecurities and uncertainties, the need to protect, whether it's your own knowledge, whether it's your own material thing, whether it's a company, it is continuously like that, and the issue is you know, as long as we are doing that, there is no moment to stop and think about, you know, global warming. That is why we are busy going through it. So my, 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 this is my last slide. That is my really, I think adaptation, vulnerability, whatever, you can look at them in any other way. But I think we need to look at this as a bigger picture.
Thank you. Thanks a lot for reminding us the importance of this much wider context. Uh, otherwise, we go into these things like decarbonizing poverty, which has shocked me, I must say. I had not heard about that. Anyway, uh, is there any burning question, urgent question for OFA? Otherwise, we move to the debate. So I would invite the speakers uh, to uh, the stage. So please, Chris. Sonia, me, Tim, and Ofa. Okay, so uh, I think well, it has been very clear and well established how powerful all these models are, but also what are the pitfalls. So the, uh, I, um, just to mention some, the fact that maybe they are too slow, as you, as you said, or that there are regional prediction in things as important as how many degrees will temperature increase in this specific area. Maybe a global increase of 1.5 may lead to local increase of 6 degrees or something like this. Um, but I'm, so this is clear for me, but I've also seen a sort of diversity of solutions. So some of you is pointing to more powerful computers, uh, larger computer infrastructures, others are pointing to better algorithms, artificial intelligence, other are maybe suggesting that simpler models may do the job. So could you comment on this? I mean, uh, are these recipes uh, um, antagonists among each other or are, should they work together? Anybody? I mean, my own view is that there isn't a single answer to this. You know, we clearly need all of these things. Um, you know, better algorithms, um, new ways of solving equations and so on. Mm. But uh, I think, you know, the general sort of comment I would make is that by any account, this, the, the, the damage to, uh, if, if one does try to estimate it economically, and I realize it's not, an, it's only, not only an economic problem, but, you know, any, any estimate, you're in the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So investing, you know, for example, in a, in a climate center that may have a budget of you know 100 million or something a year is such utterly small peanuts mm -hmm. that it's hardly it seems to me hardly worth uh, bothering oneself thinking about it because it's such a no-brainer so I would just say we need a, a, a variety I mean at the end of the day we need human intuition it's about human insight and creativity mm -hmm. that's that's the most important thing but we need the tools to enable that creativity to be expressed and I think Com and, and supercomputing is a, is a crucial part of that. And is there any step further toward this CERN of climate change, or are we being slow in this as well, let's say? Um, we're moving slowly. I mean, there are, you know, there are, it's like all these things, there, there are, you know, when, when, when you have existing institutes at the national level, there's a certain resistance to, um, you know, to... to uh, you know, resistance to new ideas, but um, I, I think that gradually people are coming around to realizing okay. this is the only way forward. Okay. Any more comment on this? Well, if I could throw out a challenge to particularly the mathematicians in the audience, that the, uh, if you look at the speed up in computing over the last, well, few decades, um, half of it's come from hardware, but the other half has come from better algorithms, better understanding how to use computers, um, and certainly as the computers get bigger and more sophisticated, the more we need mathematicians to do it. So I'd certainly like to challenge all the mathematicians, the audience, uh, pure and applied. Uh, these are fantastic areas to get involved with. Yeah, yeah, I would second this. And I mean, to go back to the topic I was presenting, I, I, I do think, and we have seen this also in Pauline's presentation, we have this huge challenge that basically dealing with climate change, mitigating climate change also has impact for human system. So I think really a new frontier is the science that's the interface between human science and physical science. And we need also really clever people who are able to simulate basically this interaction. And I think the, the basically machine learning approach or some other approach could, but just to speeding up this interaction would be very valuable. Okay, so both better hardware and better software, let's say. But I have a comment also on this um, computing consumes energy, okay? Mm. And there are certain applications, like, yeah. I don't know, Bitcoin or whatever, that consumes a lot of energy. So 
is there also maybe an ethical aspect of this within the scientific this community, let's say? Okay, so maybe I'll comment on this. I, I mean, many countries or um, also some cities have uh, called for climate emergency. It's an emergency, and so when you have an emergency, you have to have some priorities. And I would say in, in the case of climate emergency, one priority is certainly climate science. Hmm. So I think that's not where you want to cut, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, fine. I mean, fortunately, these days, it doesn't really matter where your supercomputer is. So, you know, I work in Oxford, but it doesn't matter mm -hmm. where in the world it is. So, clearly, we need to think about putting our new... Because you're right, energy is a major issue. Uh, we need to be putting them in places where there's abundant renewable energy, mm -hmm. whether it's from solar, wind, or yeah. hydroelectric, or geothermal. You know, uh, that's fine. But that's obviously got to be a, a, mm -hmm. an important consideration. Okay, and uh, I have a question especially for Sonia and uh, Ofa, but for anybody that wants to comment. Um, I mean, we have seen how complex and how difficult are models that are trying to model nature, okay, basically climate. Mm. But half or even more than half of the problem is social, economic, it has to d do with the, this uh, connection with the human behavior. And this looks to me as even more difficult to, to model, to study in a computational, mathematical way. So how can this, done be, can this be done reasonably? I mean, are there ways in which human behaviors, economic feedbacks that uh, are very important to the solution of the problem can be modeled somehow, can be handled in a reasonable way, scientific way? Well, Oh, you I want think to start? It's, it's, more, it's, it's more of Sonia because I'm yeah. not in the modeling. But uh, like I said, there is a huge amount of information that is coming from different disciplines. So the ability to handle and bring this together is the big challenge that we want those deep thinkers, the mathematicians, the computer science, to bring those things together. Otherwise, they have always acted like separate. The human aspect is always lagged behind and the physical scientists have not found a way really completely of integrating that in there. That's, I think, is still a challenge. Mm. So maybe an important message for this community is to talk with the mm. economists, social scientists, and these other disciplines yeah. that are, in principle, very far away. Yeah, we need there more may be some job to of that. Done it would uh, really encourage somebody who is in mathematics to also go like in environmental economics, for example, in modeling. Those people are really needed because they are able to take all those environmental issues and bring the economic aspects out. Mm -hmm. And then the politicians are listening because they speak numbers, or, you know, a language that they need. We have a few of those people, and they need to have this competency quantitative competence. Yeah. Sorry? yeah, so I just wanted to say that there are existing models, that's what I was mentioning. So the integrated assessment model are basically doing this. But for me, one of the main issues with those models is that they are not basically exposed to the constraints that the feedback that they would have from the climate system. That's what I was saying. So, so I think we have some existing model, but we definitely look, need to look more into detail into how they are simulating those systems. For instance, in terms of economy, there are also some basic assumptions that make a big difference. For instance, what is your discount rate? And the discount rate is basically how much do you value damage that are happening in 50 yeah. years from now compared to now. So it's not only about mathematics and physics, there are also some ethical considerations. Yeah. Will, this subject will be deal, dealt with later. So again, if, if I can throw out a challenge to the audience, I mean, models that bring human behavior in, in contact with sort of more physical things are very much at the frontiers of research, uh, particularly things like agent-based models. Um, so something that I'm working on is looking at the response of um, UK to um, tourist industry hmm. to climate change, which is something you can have a hope of modelling because you've got some data. So that these are very exciting areas to be involved with. Please. I just wanted to make a very specific comment about this whole area because I, I was interested, I, I forget who mentioned the, the tropical cyclones that hit Mozambique. Because... And I, I mean, the fatalities were in the hundreds, which is in a way surprising these days because um, most occurrences of intense tropical cyclones, the predictions are pretty good. And yeah, whereas you might go back <coughs> to the 70s and find fatalities <coughs> in the thousands, um, you know, most of the time you rarely get you know, more than a few tens of, of people. So I talked to some of the disaster aid agencies about why this was. And one comment I got back, which I thought was interesting, which was interesting but sort of depressing in a way, which was that 
although people were aware of the predictions, they were reluctant to leave their houses because the houses might get burgled and their life possessions would be lost. Mm -hmm. Now, if ever there was a time for the international community to step up and say, okay, when there's something which clearly, as was said, has a climate change element to it, i.e. clearly caused by the developed world, we should be able to say, we will underwrite those losses. Mm. Don't worry about that, because that's something that will be underwritten. So mm. your decision to leave shouldn't be based on these things. It should be based on the safety of your and your family's lives. Mm. Okay. So these are very direct things, which obviously involved an interaction between the science and the social science and the economics and things. But clearly, we have to move mm. forward. Mm. This idea that we only react to events after they have occurred is so sort of 20th century, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've got to move forward. We've got to move ahead of this. Okay, so I don't want to take too much time with my questions, although I have many, and so I would uh, uh, ask people to um, post their questions if they want. Please. Hi, nice uh, presentations. So I have a question for Tim. Uh, you mentioned trillions uh, of economic losses. Can you say a few more words about the kinds of models uh, or if, if uh, these kinds of numbers um, are things we can um, um, talk about seriously, or I mean, how, how strong are these predictions? And, um, well, I mean, the, the predictions are based on these uh, impact assessment models that um, you know are routinely wa uh, run uh, in, in um, you know by economists. Uh, um, I, I, personally, I mean, I, I sort of agree with what Chris said, that, which is that this is an area where the economic modeling is actually rather crude and, and they typically take very coarse-grained um, inputs from the climate models to do these economic assessments and that a much more kind of agent-based approach where one goes actually down to a much more micro level and indeed then uses the climatic data at that appropriate micro level would lead to uh, a much more kind of reliable assessment. But that's... Um, you know, the numbers in the trillions are, 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 are kind of, the, that's the commonplace kind of estimates from these rather coarse-grained inter integrated assessment models. So I also have a comment about the discount rates. Um, discount rates are based on uh, an assumption of uh, independent events in the future uh, leading to an exponential decay of the value of future losses, for example. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that humans and animals don't use exponential decay, they yeah. use uh, like a 1 over t decay. Yeah. And there's some uh, good statistical reasons why you want to do this uh, yeah. due to uncertainty. So if you just do a sort of Bayesian analysis of uh, the fact that you might die at some point in the future, um, and so you don't care about what happens after you die, then you get something like 1 over t. But that's only for individuals. If you think about collectively, uh, we as a species, hopefully won't die, you know, so soon. And so the whole calculation of discount rates just doesn't make any sense, right? So the, the, the whole procedure that we've been using in economics to value future losses is really from the point of view of an individual person. But just, it just doesn't apply to the whole society. If I can make a remark, I think there will be a full talk <laughs> dealing with this subject, right, Manfred? So I invite you to stay and continue to interact uh, because uh, it will be dealt with extensively. Okay. I, I just say I fully agree with that comment. Personally. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, so first off, thank you so much for four really amazing talks. Um, this question is probably to anyone, but probably either to Professor Budd or Professor Dubé. Um, so two of our speakers talked about how pressing, of a, uh, how pressing climate change is and how we need to make action very, very soon. But the other two speakers made comments about um, there being error, you know, reasonable error in the models, and this being a big talking point for um, skeptic denialists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask, how do you, um, actually Professor Palmer touched on this a bit, saying that it would even be disingenuous to say it will definitely be um, catastrophic, even though it probably will be. Uh, how do you find that it's best to interact with people who are not well versed in uh, climate science. Uh, how do you present the error to people, but make it uh, known that this is it's still um, something that needs to be acted on immediately? 
Well, Sorry. I, I could comment on this point. I mean, one, one good example to communicate is, I mean, obviously, we, we don't have a full certainty of our, you know, the, as also Tim was showing, so, I mean, there are some as a certain part in the system, but we don't need to be fully 100% sure of the outcome to take a decision. So, mm. let's say you take a plane and you know that, you know, there is a 10% or 20% chance that it's going to crash, probably you're not going to take this plane. That's the whole point. I mean, you don't need to be 100% sure that it's going to crash to decide and suddenly, okay, I don't take it. And actually, in these cases, I would say, and actually I just wrote a few days ago uh, a top uh, small article on this point, we don't need full certainty to take decisions. And in some cases, uncertainty should rather push you to act more quickly because there are all those aspects we are not totally sure about. Yeah. And, and if I can comment, as I, as I said, when, when you develop a model, when you develop a model, you try to quantify the uncertainty. So you, you have a good estimate of how big your error is. And, and if within that estimate you're still going up by a few degrees, then that's what's going to happen. And, and you can then say, well, honestly, we've tried to consider everything and we're still making this prediction. And there's a very big difference between that and the prediction, which is that the Earth is cooling, which is certain, a certain of the climate deniers might, might claim is what's happening. Tim? I, I think it's crucially important uh, as scientists that we're honest and we're scientifically rigorous. And you, if you make overblown statements which are not justified, you'll be found out. And then actually the harm is you do more harm than good because then people completely discount you and maybe all your colleagues and everybody else uh, that, that is said. So it's, it's really, this is a really important issue that you have to be faithful to the science and be dispassionate and disinterested if you like in presenting the science. You don't present a partial account because you want to get some message over and you give it more uh, sort of beef than, than it's deserved. And as Sonia said, it's quite right. I mean, we, 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 we're taking action because we, nobody wants to risk, you know, uh, the levels of climate change that could literally make large fractions of society uh, unable to live in those areas. I mean, if you have heat waves where it's 50-something degrees and 90% humidity, body can't lose heat. So you, you either die or you go somewhere else. It's as simple as that. So you don't want to risk these things, and this is why we're doing what we're doing. But, but above all, you have to be honest and don't exaggerate. Okay. Yeah. Any remark? Or? Yeah. No, I, I, the, the way to approach it, I mean, now it's much easier. It was a problem maybe 30 years back. But now people have actually observed that there are real changes in climate. Mm -hmm. So you begin with the observations. Okay. And if you are from the same area where there is already climate variability, there's already a knowledge that you, it's very difficult for any human being to exactly predict the climate. So that is, the, the, the uncertainty is kind of accepted. The difficulty is usually with the policy makers yeah. who are looking for a way of uh, dodging the reality, you know. So they will stick on that uncertainty and use it as an ex a reason why they are not acting. Anyway, there will be Perfect. also a talk on communication in the second part, so I invite you to stay. Thanks Following so questions. Good afternoon. Um, so all of our scientific developments um, in the past have had unforeseen consequences. We had it with the uh, um, poisoning, radiation poisoning, lead poisoning. We had it with the greenhouses from fossil fuels. We had it with saturation, saturating the planet with plastics. And the golden thread that runs through these scientific developments has got to be, they, were, they all sounded too good to be true. And every time I hear about climate change, the one that sounds too good to be true is often um, renewable energy sources. So, uh, do we think there might be unforeseen consequences there? I'd especially be interested in hearing from those that don't think that. Why not? Okay, so I invite you to go to the spot because we have two minutes left before the coffee break, so whoever wants to comment. Well, I might could make a quick comment on this. I would say it's not too good to be true. Actually, the one thing that is very difficult to understand is why we are still using fossil fuels while renewable energy is now so cheap. Mm. So it's much cheaper. But obviously there are some limitations for some aspects and this needs to be considered carefully. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you for your talks. So many of you mentioned climate science modeling as um, a direct, uh, a field where you can couple machine learning and AI with. 
Um, and some of you also mentioned later about other challenges in environmental sustainability and climate change, such as modeling human behavior. Uh, I was wondering what kinds of problems or data sets or formulations you can do in the latter part um, that you haven't already talked about. Okay. Well, as I say, what, what I'm <clears throat> particularly interested in at the moment is the effect of climate change on human activity. So one of the areas I'm, I'm particularly looking at at the moment is the impact on agriculture and also the impact on energy. So in, in all of these cases, we have the projections of climate change into the future for the next 50 years, and we have to then couple that with models of how we expect humans are going to behave, both in agriculture and energy. So these are both areas where um, we are certainly using machine learning to couple that in with the climate projections. Okay, can, can I, I mean, I just to sort of reiterate something I said, which I, I feel strongly about. I mean, clim uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is definitely, these are all buzz phrases at the moment, and, and you know, there's lots of funding and so on, which is, which is good. But, uh, you know, as scientists, again, I think we need to think carefully about where it's appropriate and where it may not, or, or where it may lead to, I think it's a previous question, uh, sort of unexpected consequences. And, you know, a skeptic might say AI is just glorified curve fitting. And the problem with that is when you're dealing with out of sample um, situations, which clearly you are if you're talking about climate change in the future, then you really have to ask yourself, uh, is your curve fitting going to adequately extrapolate into the future? And that for me is always one of the big headaches in this field. One last question, quick question yep, and you. one last answer. Quick answer, please. <laughs> Something with which I'm concerned is the communication of the scientific community with congressmen, for instance, and politicians about the results that we actually have. What I'm concerned with is not so much our ability to present those results in a readable way as with the uh, sort of freedom that politicians have sometimes to fundamentally disagree with the status of scientific knowledge. I'm wondering if we have made any advancements or whether there are sort of any international efforts among scientists to actually put pressure on politicians and political interest groups to uh, change the way that they can make arguments so that they actually agree with scientific knowledge as something which can be true. Can, can I defer you to, uh, refer you to the first talk of the next session and, and then maybe in a coffee break you can interact with the speakers, sorry, but uh, the first talk is precisely on this, I guess. So um, thanks a lot. We have a half an hour coffee break, now a little bit less, and we meet again at 15.15, okay? Thank you.